have illust illustrator Tim Bowers, who will be speaking tonight. And uh, the person facilitating his talk is Chelsea Elliott. Um, some of you might remember Chelsea. She was on the committee uh, for the Faith and Fellowship Book Festival, and, and she has uh, been one of our featured book club guests and um, very instrumental in, in helping us uh, organize this vir virtual festival. So thank them both for being here. I, we thank them both for being here, and I am going to now turn it over. So thank you all. Thank you, Yolanda. I am very honored to be able to introduce um, Tim Bowers. Tim Bowers is an American illustrator of children's books known for his humorous and whimsical characters. Three of his children's books, book titles have appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. Oh. Bowers has created hundreds of greeting card illustrations, including many top selling cards. Tim is also an award-winning fine artist, creating finely detailed miniature paintings. He and his wife live in Ohio and have four grown children and three great-grandchildren. I now present Tim Bowers. Thank you for being here, Tim. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, my pleasure. Um, yeah, welcome. I'm um, a children's book illustrator. I've uh, been in Ohio uh, most of my life, and <clears throat> I'm usually asked to talk about my books, which I'm, I gladly do, um, but tonight, uh, because it's the Faith and Fellowship Book Festival. I thought I would, I pulled out some things I don't usually show uh, here in the studio. And I, I can uh, kind of um, talk a little more on a personal level and uh, uh, along with the, the whole bookmaking process and that um, aspect of what I do. I was born and grew up in Troy, Ohio, just north of Dayton. And my dad was a factory worker. He worked at NCR in Dayton, a uh, tool and dye uh, worker. And my mom was a beautician, a hairstyles beautician. My grandmother owned the shop. She was a beautician, Opal's Beauty Shop in Troy. My great grandpa was a barber. So there was a lot of haircutting in the family. Um, I'm, sure, I'm not sure how I ended up you know, like, like this, but um, um, I really never thought about becoming a barber. Uh, I always loved being a kid. I would uh, love animals. I love playing. I love music. Uh, a lot of the normal things that kids like as, as you're growing up. And um, but art just seemed to be something I really enjoyed doing. I have a from time to time here, I will hold up a, a, a visual. This is one of the drawings I did when I was a kid. You can see I have an idea. It's uh, pretty crude, but um are you still there yes we are here okay. the the screen went black so i just wanted to make sure i was still visible um but anyway so i i've been drawing since i was a little boy my grandparents lived down the street from us and they had all kinds of animals at their house um they had chickens running around the yard they had ponies in a little barn behind the house they had dogs and cats and canaries and parakeets and tropical fish. But Grandpa also had some pretty unusual animals. There's a, uh, a drawing I did. I did this drawing in high school. It's a drawing of my grandpa and his bird, whose name was Chico. He's an African gray parrot. And Chico could say some words in English, could say some words in Spanish, could bark like a dog. Very talented bird. So um, I would uh, go to their house and I could watch the bird. I didn't get too close to it because it had a big black beak and large talons. And um, it was best to keep your distance as a grandkid. But um, my grandpa also had a monkey. He had a couple of monkeys. And the one I remember was a squirrel monkey named Jojo. And so Jojo would uh, usually in his cage, but on a certain occasions, my grandpa would let him out. He would climb the curtains and sit on the curtain rods. So there were always animals. I could go, I could tease the monkey, I could chase the chickens, I could ride the ponies. There was always something to do it at my grandpa's, uh, grandparents' house. So when I sat down to draw, like I showed you in that uh, little sketch I did, there's a good chance that I would start drawing animals, 
or cartoon characters. Those were some of my favorite subjects as a little boy. This is one of the books I had, and it taught me how to draw Woody Woodpecker. And uh, Woody Woodpecker is still a pretty popular character in the schools when I visit. Um, I will mention some names and they just give me a blank stare. But when I mention Woody Woodpecker, most of the crowd has heard of that character. This book wasn't the one I had when I was a kid. This was actually found by my good friend, Dave Groff. And um, he picked it up and gave it to me, knowing that uh, this is the, the exact book that I had, or one like this, when I was little. There are a lot of things I remember as a little boy, my grandparents and the animals, drawing. Um, we lived close to a creek, so we were always out, you know, pretending we were um, Tarzan or, you know, just explorers and, and those sort of things. So I always I had a great imagination, but there was one book in our house, and this is the book, I think it was published in 1954, I'm not sure, exactly sure but it's a collection of Bible stories. And this book was always in our living room. And I remember always looking through it. I didn't read the stories so much, but the artwork inside of there was just captured my attention. There are color plates every so often in the book. And they were just amazing. The colors and the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the content of these uh, color plates. And so that just stuck in my memory. And, and years later, I was able to, to get a hold of this uh, this book, and it means a lot, and that, that's one of the, the books that was always there at, when I was growing up, along with my books from school, like this um, book club and uh, Reader's Weekly and, and those sort of things. So I was a pretty average student uh, when it came to grades. I was usually struggling with math or science or uh, most of the other subjects. However, when it came to art, um, I really had a, um, I had some talent there and I loved drawing. And so the more you practice something, I always stress this when I go to schools, uh, the more you practice something, the better you get. And I practiced a lot as a little boy, just drawing silly faces and Woody Woodpecker and animals and uh, you name it, I would draw it. Um, <clears throat> so I played some sports. I played, I wrestled, did some uh, football. But in uh, my junior year of, of uh, high school, I um, quit the football team and discovered that I had broken both of my wrists. And uh, there's a good chance I probably did that in football. But it, um, it forced me to kind of take a break. And with a cast on one arm and then a cast on the other arm, they, they actually took bone from my elbows and put in into my wrist. To, uh, and so I spent some time trying to figure out what I could do, um, you know, because there are a lot of things I couldn't do with casts on. One thing, um, when the cast was on my right hand, is I could draw with my left hand and vice versa. Although I'm left-handed, so the, um, the art that I did with my right hand is not nearly as good as left-handed, but it really helped me focus on my artwork and... Um, you know, when you're growing up, you, I, I like music. I played, sang in a band. I, I had uh, some art going on. I had sports. Nothing was really, I didn't really focus on anything. So that really forced me to kind of hone in and focus on, on uh, basically one area. And so art was what I uh, narrowed it down to. Fortunately for me, I had some really good friends in high school that were um, going to youth group at a local church, the Methodist Church in Troy. And there was a, a youth pastor there, his name was Cliff Stewart. And Cliff and his wife, Evie, um, were just super good youth uh, leaders. And so there are a lot of kids that I went to school with in the community that were very involved in the church and wanted to, to, to volunteer doing things and to, to hang out together and be a, a really supportive of one another. And, and I, I was really fortunate to have that group um, in Troy. So uh, during my, the last couple of years in high school, um, <clears throat> I, I pretty much avoided any um, real big um, bad decisions and, and was then decided to go to art school to pursue my um, 
career or you know, education. Uh, because I was an average student, that would make, made the most sense. Art school, you didn't have to take a lot of math and science, and it was mostly drawing, painting, color, uh, design, things like that. And so I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design over in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, spent four and a half years there. And I, I, I um, studied illustration as a major. Um, and I brought, here's a piece that I did in probably my junior year in college. And it might be hard to see. It's David and Goliath. And these are my two roommates that I used as models. This is John Jude Palancar, who modeled for David, and David Groff, who modeled for Goliath. So um, as a student, you know, you, you use whatever you can uh, to come up with your ideas and your, your reference for your artwork. And so they were there and available. So I used them uh, for one of the illustrations. Another piece that I did in, in close to my, uh, close to graduation, and this is a, uh, a guitar player named Phil Keggy. And uh, this was done as kind of an album cover design. But at the time you can see I was, I was doing more editorial type art and the children's book work didn't come until a little bit later. I've always enjoyed cartooning, you know, the Woody Woodpecker and that sort of stuff. But I never um, thought I'd be a children's book illustrator until a little later. I kind of thought I'd be a um, an editorial illustrator for magazines and that sort of thing. Well, magazines started phasing out. Uh, photography was taking over a lot of the illustration jobs and uh, it's just a, the whole industry was, was changing. And uh, my junior year in college, I had a chance to work for a studio in Dayton, Ohio. And the studio was Wanamaker's. And so this is one of the illustrations I did for the Detroit News. Um, and this was some football heads. This was an ad that ran in a magazine. And you can, you can still see uh, there's a lot of humor in my artwork, but I didn't really um, put that into, into um, children's book subject matter yet. Here's a poster I did. Again, it's humorous. And it's starting to become almost a, a character that could be in a book, but it was all um, advertising art and that sort of stuff. Well, we also did a lot of work for Procter and Gamble and Huffy Bicycles, and at the time, Cool Cigarettes, and there's just a, a lot of different things came through the door that needed artwork. And I left at, right after graduation from college. I went back to work there for a short time and then felt kind of uncomfortable just in the the the, the type of work and the, I just felt like I wanted to make a break and do something different. So I thought I would go to New York and show my portfolio to some of the publishers and get um, maybe some children's book uh, work. So I did that. I put together a portfolio of humorous stuff and some children's book type uh, work and I went to New York and um, I contacted the uh, um, oh geez the uh, anyway I got a list of publishers and I started cold calling them and and uh, went and several of them said come on over and show us your work and I did this was back in seventy or back in probably nineteen eighty um, seventy nine eighty right in there. And so there were, they were very encouraging, but I came back from New York and didn't have any work from the trip, uh, was encouraged to keep going with it. And so I started freelancing and um, then met my wife at a Christian art conference. And um, we married and then I uh, took a job at Hallmark Cards. And so we packed up from Dayton, Ohio and moved out to Kansas City, Missouri. And I worked there for five years. Um, <clears throat> I also picked up some freelance work while working on greeting cards. I did work for Contemporary Christian Music Magazine. And then uh, I did some work for Zondervan and Tyndale and Cook. Um, and ended up doing uh, work for Focus on the Family. And I did um, for a number of years 
did spot illustrations for Focus on the Family for the um, uh, Clubhouse and Clubhouse Junior magazines. And uh, there were, they had a, a, a place in the magazine where uh, kids could write in with questions and then the um, magazine people would answer the questions and they needed a little pieces of artwork to go in that section. So every month, every issue, I would do new artwork to, uh, to go in and focus on the family clubhouse. I believe it was clubhouse. And then later I started doing clubhouse junior. Here's one of the covers I did for clubhouse junior. Some little animals playing marbles. This is a couple of years ago. This is 2008. So it kind of dates itself there, but um, I enjoyed the work. And, and there were a number of years where, you know, I, I would expect to hear from them every month and get, get work. Um, greeting cards were fun. It was a lot, there were a lot of good people, a lot of good artists that worked at Hallmark. And it was one of the best uh, educations I could have asked for when it came to um, uh, knowing how to, to make good greeting card art and um, just learning more about art, you know, commercial artwork and techniques and things like that. Um, I helped them start Shoebox Greetings, which was a, a tiny little division at the time. It was a pretty good gr group of um, artists and writers and, and management people who uh, came out with this line of cards and they called them Shoebox Greetings and very successful line, line of cards through the years. Um, but after five years, my wife and I decided uh, it's, it's best to, to move back to Ohio, closer to family. Now, during the five years at Hallmark, I had a chance to work on my very first children's book. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Somewhere here. I hope there is. Um, the Toy Circus was my very first children's book. And this is a copy of The Toy Circus. And that was worked on it in the, like 86. It was published in 87. And um, the, the way I got the book while still working at Hallmark was I had done some work in Dayton for a company. They were a book packager, which means they take a story that an author has written and they take a sample piece of artwork. And this is the sample I did for that text. You can see a bear and a clown. And, and then they put together a book dummy and they send all of this out to different publishers and they um, sell it to the publisher and they handle all the design work. They put it together. It's like a whole package deal. That's why they're called uh, book packagers. So um, I did the sample piece of art. The story was written by Jan Wall, who is an author up in uh, Sylvania, Ohio. And it, it traveled around different publishers for about a year and with no luck. And finally, I sent them a letter. I said, you know, it's, it's fine if you want to send that sample back. And, you know, thanks for tr trying kind of a thing. And uh, about that time, they got a, a, a bite. You know, there's somebody decided, Harcourt Brace Yovanovich, a publisher out in California, decided to uh, publish the book. So that was my very first book. And it was, it was gotten through not an agent, but I did have a, a, this book packager representing me um, in that way. So that was good. Um, it also, after my very first book, I had a chance to visit my very first school. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but there I am with a bunch of students in Topeka, Kansas. With one book under my belt, the school call, called me and asked if I would come and share my children's book with that school. And I, I think there were two or three schools in Topeka um, that I went to visit. And so there were a lot of things happening. We also had two daughters a while and during those um, three, actually three daughters in those five years. Um, so um, we moved back to Ohio. I had a book under my belt. I think I'd done two out in Kansas City and working on a third. Um, but it was time to make a move. So I was able to focus on the books. I, I still did a greeting cards on a freelance basis. Um, so that's kind of where I came from. Um, Troy to CCAD in Columbus, Ohio, the art school. 
and then a short uh, time at a, an advertising art studio and then Hallmark cards. And finally, I was able to focus on my book work and that's what I've been doing since then. That was probably the, the, the late eighties or early nineties. Um, and I've done over 50 titles through the years. And there were some years where I didn't have any books. There were some years where I had four books published. And uh, I've learned that, you know, it's great when I have uh, th two or three or four books coming out in a year, but it's, you know, there are times when it kind of dries up a little bit. And I just have to say, you know, if that door is closing, then what door will open? You know, there's, there's usually something else that takes its place. Um, and yeah, I'm just, you know, I try to be willing to go in whatever direction that, that leads me. But so far the books have, have um, kept going. When I get a book project, and this is the way it usually starts. Uh, the book packager was a, a unique situation. Since then, uh, it pretty much follows the same routine. And that is a publisher will call me uh, and offer me a book or offer, offer to send me the, the text and I can decide whether I want to illustrate it or not. But uh, I, I usually, I get a lot of requests from authors like in emails and um, they'll say that they've seen my work somewhere and they think that I'd be perfect for their story. And um, sometimes, most of the time they're self-publishing or sometimes they, they don't, they're very vague. They don't know what they're doing, but they would, they think my work and their writing would be perfect. And it might be, but I usually send them a note and say that it usually works where the publisher chooses the artist for the project. And that's traditional publishing, not self-publishing so much. But uh, through the years, I, I only started getting requests for self-published projects um, later on. When I first started, they were usually just people that were trying to figure out how to make their own uh, well, it's still self-published, but it's not what it is today. Um, so I say, you know, you can try to sell your story to a publisher and then you can throw my name in the hat. And I would, you know, I would take a look at it and be a part of the project if it's okay with the publisher. But it's always the publisher who chooses or I always, you know, that's the way it worked with most of my books. Um, so I get a, a, a call from the publisher. They'll send me the manuscript. This is a manuscript for Memoirs of a Goldfish by Devin Skillion. And uh, sometimes it's, it's broken up into pages. Sometimes it's not. And I have to go through and, and break it up into, uh, to fit into 32 pages. Um, it's worked both ways for me that, like that. After um, reading the manuscript, then I draw some little boxes with my pencil usually 32 for 32 pages. And I start getting some thumbnail sketches is what I call them, but they're just real quick ideas for each page, how to tell the story in 32 pages based on what I read in the manuscript. And so um, sometimes the book will really follow this, the thumbnails and other times I ended up, up moving things around and re, rethinking certain passages and that sort of thing. But from the thumbnails, then I put together what's called a book dummy. And there's a book dummy for every book I've illustrated. Uh, used to be that I would make them out of white paper like this, and I would um, fold it in the middle and staple it. And then I'd glue my pencil sketches inside of the book dummy. And there are 32 pages in this book dummy. And uh, this is after I've drawn all the sketches to the size of the actual book. I send this to the publisher and the publisher then gets an idea of how I want to illustrate the book from page to page. And it's really important because you can turn the pages and see how the text is split up and how the book reads, both uh, with the, the text and with the, the visuals. So um, a lot of times I'll get this returned with a lot of posty notes in it. Uh, indicating changes that they would like to see uh, made to the to the book dummy. And so that goes back and forth a couple of times. Um, and then after the book dummy is approved, I go to the final artwork. And the final artwork for a book can take uh, anywhere from a month 
to three months to complete, depending on how complex the, the artwork is. If I'm working in oils or acrylic and that sort of thing, yeah. or computer. Yeah, you don't need to color code. Um, so anyway, that's a book dummy. So I go from the, the thumbnails to the book dummy to the final artwork. And like I say, I've, I've done uh, over 50 titles and there are a couple of them where I've, I've done a little extra to prepare for uh, creating the artwork. I did a series of books with Cynthia Ryland and Cynthia Ryland wrote um, several stories about a little guinea pig who lives in a toy store. And these books are called Little Whistle. And so for Little Whistle, I made a clay sculpture of the little character. And I made this little sculpture out of um, Sculpey. And the Sculpey is uh, it's soft. You buy it kind of soft and you can mold it into things. Then you bake it for a few minutes and it hardens. And so I used the Sculpey to make Little Whistle. And I could use this as a model to draw from, from the side or from the back, whatever I needed for this book. And like I said, there was a series of books, so that came in uh, real handy, the little sculpture. I don't do one of these for every character, but uh, several books I have done that. Another book that I illustrated is titled, Sometimes I Wonder If Poodles Like Noodles. This was written by Laura Numeroff. And I don't know if you're probably more familiar with Laura Numeroff's books. Uh, if you give a mouse a cookie, uh, if you give a pig a pancake, a moose a muffin, on and on and on. She's an amazing writer. She's done a lot. Of, all these writers, are, I think, are amazing. Um, I've tried to write stories and, and a, a several times submitted things, and they just haven't uh, gone very far. So I really appreciate when, when uh, authors get it right. <laughs> and these, these two seem to get it right a lot. Um, but anyway... This book, I wanted the characters to be more realistic. You can see the little girl on the cover. So I took some photographs of my own kids at the time they were younger, much younger. And I took some of the photographs and I worked from these photographs to create the artwork. And this is kind of hard to see some of the photos, but just my point is sometimes I will sketch out of my head and use my imagination. Other times I'll make a little clay sculpture to look at as a model. And sometimes if I, I'm working more realistically, I will take photographs and then paint the, the illustrations using the photographs for detail. This is my daughter, Allison. She posed as the, the main character in this book. And all of my, my four kids who are now in their uh, 30s, they all are in this book. They all posed in this book. My wife posed for one of the characters in the book. I'm even in the, in the book uh, as one of the characters. So that has some special meaning, you know, that book. Um, and again, I don't take photographs for every, every title, but, you know, I try, to, uh, I try to remain open to whatever the book needs to, be, to tell the story, you know, and that, that the whole thing, that everything I do uh, kind of, serves the story. And so after I read that manuscript, I'm thinking of the characters, what type of characters, how to best tell the story, you know, the composition of each page, the turning of the pages from one image to the next, um, how will a reader view that? And what does it say, you know, when a close up or something far away, or um, there are a lot of things to consider when you're illustrating a book in 32 pages or whatever the, the page count is. Um, there are a couple books, I'll go through these kind of quickly, but this is Dream Big Little Pig, written by Christy Yamaguchi. She's a, a famous ice skater and also one dancing with the stars. And uh, you may be familiar with her um, Olympic gold medal uh, that she won in ice skating. And believe it or not, the main character is an ice skating little uh, pig here the character. So who would have thought that Christy Yamaguchi would write a book about an ice skating uh, little uh, character? But anyway, Poppy the Pig. It was a very cute story, and this was a lot of fun to work on. And there's glitter on the cover, so it was a very um, girly type book. Uh, fun Dog, Sun Dog. There's a series of books here with Fun Dog, Sun Dog. And um, the, the thing about this book is I, and I think I have, 
Here we go. Sometimes a publisher will say, can you do a sample illustration before you start on the artwork? So we get an idea of what you have in mind for this book, this story. So I did this piece of artwork. I don't know if I, I'm trying to get the glare off. There's a little boy and his dog. And you can see it's pretty realistic. He's throwing a Frisbee on the beach. And I sent this to the publisher. It was Marshall Cavendish at the time. Now it's uh, Amazon, uh, Two Lions. They, they got back with me and said it was a little too realistic. They wanted a little more fun, a little more uh, um, cartoony look to it. And so I redid the piece. And this is what I sent them as a second illustration. You can see it's not as realistic. It still shows the little boy and the dog and the Frisbee. But it's a more dramatic composition. And the characters are more humorous, more uh, simplified stylized we sometimes say and and so that's the direction that all these books went fun dog sun dog cool dog school dog um, tinka is the name of this character little dog and these were written by deborah heiligman so that was a fun uh, book to work on not your typical dragon was a book that was picked up by dolly pardon and the imagination uh, library this was one year this was one on her list and uh, now Scholastic is, is selling a, a paperback uh, version of this. Not your typical dragon. It's about a little dragon who doesn't breathe fire, breathes bubbles, he breathes marshmallows. Um, he's just all over the place, but he's not your typical uh, fire breathing dragon. And so it's a story about uh, you know, fitting in and, and um, having uh, talents that are unique and that sort of thing. Dog Ku by Andrew Clements. And it's uh, all written in haiku. So, I mean, I've done so many books and they're all so different and special. Gorgonzola, a very stinky saurus about a dinosaur. And uh, Rappy by Dan Gutman. Oh, and um, Gorgonzola was by Margie Palatini. And this is by Dan Gutman. Rappy the Raptor, and he, he talks in rhyme. And there were actually two uh, large books like this. And then there was a series of four early readers. Yeah. So I, I do all kinds of um, characters in my books. And that's one thing I enjoy is each book has its own challenges. Um, my newest books, and I will finish with these and then I'll do some drawing. Uh, let's see, Backroads Country Toads. This was a book written by Devin Skillion. And um, this is a good example of uh, my attempt at writing uh, not being so successful. I came up with an idea for two little toads. And it was these two little characters. And I put them into some simple storylines. And I sent them to my agent at the time. His name was Ruben. His name is Ruben Pfeffer. And I don't know if you've heard of Ruben. He's a super nice guy, knows his stuff. He, uh, he was the guy I worked with on my very first book. He was uh, in the design department, I believe then, at Harcourt Brace Yovanovich, and worked his way through. He became a vice president at Simon & Schuster and uh, a couple other positions, and then left that to become an agent. And so now he uh, has a Ruben Pfeffer content and represents uh, illustrators and authors. But Ruben um, took these little stories of the two uh, country toads and they really nobody was really interested in them. And so I thought, okay, I know a guy who is an excellent writer. He had written uh, uh, some of the um, memoir books and I'll get to one of those in a minute. And the memoir books were very popular and Devin Skillion is his name. He's a, he's a news anchor up in Detroit. And he also writes country music. So he's a, a man of many skills, but I knew he could write a really good story. So I asked Devin if he'd take my character, these two characters and work as a team to produce a story um, for, for them. And so he came up with this, uh, Backroads Country Toads. And he did a great job. I mean, this is, I love this book. It's, I don't think it's getting the, the attention it deserves, but um, you know, it came out and when a book comes out, sometimes um, 
there's a lot of push behind it. Sometimes there's not much push behind it. And like in the, during the pandemic, I mean, I had a book come out, two books come out. And uh, I mean, those, those books are pretty much lost because the book, bookstores were closed. The schools were closed. Uh, it was a terrible time to have a book released. But, you know, you do what you can, you move on. But um, Backroads Country Toads, one of my newer books about the, these two little uh, country toads. Memoirs of a Tortoise. This is one of the memoir books I, was, I mentioned. This is by Devin Skillion. And this book came out just before the, or early in the pandemic. This is a book about loss, dealing with loss and how and appreciating uh, the things in your life, the people in your life. And um, so early on in the pandemic, it was a very tough time for a lot of people. And so the, the timing of this book was perfect because um, you know, there, were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, loss, death, and you know, things to deal with. And for kids, you know, it could be a very tough time. It's a tough time for everybody. But uh, this book, I think, probably came at a good time where kids could read about um, the tortoise. Tortoise and his, his owner, Ike, are both 80 years old. And Ike passes away and tortoise is still young for a tortoise. So he can't figure out why Ike passed away so early, so young. So he travels to talk to his mother and his mother then tells him, you know, that uh, there, these people are in your life for a short time. You, you need to appreciate them while they're there. And um, it's a really touching story. And I think it was an appropriate and timely story uh, during the pandemic. So the memoir books, these things, the first one was Memoirs of a Goldfish, and it was very popular. We came out with Memoirs of an Elf, uh, Memoirs of a Hamster, Memoirs of a Parrot, and then Memoirs of a Tortoise. And uh, I'm getting ready this next year, I'll be working on uh, a new memoir book uh, with Devin. So uh, something to look forward to. Okay, Buddy's New Buddy is a, another book that came out um, let's see was this one that uh, just recently in the last this past year uh, buddy's new buddy is written by christina geist and christina geist uh wrote two other books that i've illustrated buddy's bedtime battery and sorry grown-ups you can't go to school which was on the new york times bestseller list and um their story is about this family buddy is the little boy and he's got a, a sister named lady and um, the first book, he was very young, and then he starts going to school. And now his best friend moved away um, just before the class um, field trip. And so Buddy is, is kind of sad. And um, school's just started. He lost his best friend at school. But there's a new student that just moved in. Her name is Sunny. And so Buddy and Sunny find that they have a lot of things in common. And so it's a book about finding things that we share in common. Um, and so it's, it's a really another very nice message. And uh, this is one of the newest books uh, by Christina Geist. And Christina is also married to Willie Geist. If, you've, um, if you know who Willie Geist is on TV, um, that's the, the same family. So, um, and then the last one I will talk about, and it's, it's, the title is, It's Better Being a Bunny. And this is PJ Funny Bunny. Do you see that there? And there are a lot of other PJ Funny Bunny books um, available. And these books are super, super popular all around the world. But uh, Marilyn Sadler wrote the story and Roger Bolin did the original artwork for the, the PJ Funny Bunny books. Uh, Roger passed away a few years ago, and um, the publisher uh, saw a renewed interest in the character, and Marilyn had written some new stories. So they were interested in publishing new stories with PJ Funny Bunny and still carrying on Roger Boland's um, look, his style of illustration. And so I um, talked to Marilyn and submitted some samples and ended up being selected to do a couple of new stories of PJ Funny Bunny in the style of uh, Roger Bolin. 
And so that's what you see here. And these are, he's super fun to draw. And he's got a cast of characters that he, that he uh, pots the pig. And, and uh, so anyway, It's Better Being a Bunny is uh, one of my newest books by Marilyn Sadler. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears. That's pretty much my, um, my life in a nutshell, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I've been a, a really blessed or lucky or whatever you wanna say uh, in being able to make a living doing my artwork. Uh, little did I know, when I was a kid, my dad was a factory worker, my mom was a beautician. They had no idea I would grow up and become an artist. Um, so I, I'm really lucky I was able to, to um, get a job, raise a family, and, um, and survive on my artwork. And uh, you know, a lot of people don't, they substitute that with other things, but I've just been real fortunate so far. <laughs> so, um, and uh, you know, those, things, those things happen if you're prepared. I used to post a, a scripture on, on my, my workspace when I worked at the, the studio in Dayton, Ohio. And they're you know, out of Proverbs, it says, a man's mind plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And um, so I was always thinking of what I wanted to do or where I wanted to be or what, what kind of work I wanted. And so I made plans, but you never know if the plans are going to uh, unfold or if there's going to be another door that opens. Or, But I think it's always good to be prepared and to work, in my case, continue to, to improve my artwork learn more about the industry, the children's books, and, um, you know, talk to people and network with people. Um, and that's true for anybody that would ask me if uh, today, if they're interested in becoming a, a children's book illustrator, or even an author, is to work on your craft, and make plans and learn what you can, and then be aware of doors that may open, you know, God might have plans that will um, put you on that path, or you might have an alternate plan, something you hadn't even thought about. And I think that's, that's important. So anyway, that was a scripture that was um, important to me then. And, and through the years, it's kind of popped up um, from time to time. Anyway, I'm going to switch to this easel back here. And as a matter of fact, I might be able to put it a little closer. Can you see that? Okay. All right. Um, I'm left-handed, so I'm gonna try to stay out of your way here. But when I draw, I usually draw with a pencil so that I can erase the mistakes um, and sketch it in before I get to the final drawing or the final painting. And so I would like to do just a couple of fun drawings. And uh, I'll use my blue marker as a pencil, and then I'll come back with my black ink and trace the uh, final. So I'll draw a shape here, kind of a bean shape. And then maybe a body, some eyes, the nose. Hey, Tim, I think the paper is a little bright. Is it bright? The color. You can't see the blue? Really. It's okay if you can't see it too, really well because once I start using the black marker, you'll be able to see it. I don't know how to decrease. That's okay. The, That's okay. Just uh, keep going then. <laughs> all right. Let's see if it works out. And then um, okay. So if you can see this, great. If you can't, trust me, I have lines here to kind of indicate what the character is going to look like. There's a bean shape and some circles. I can see it in my head. Now it's just a matter of adding some detail. And that's what I encourage kids to do is to start with the shapes first. Get, if those are right, then your final drawing is gonna look better. Is that, can you see that better? That looks great. All right. Oh, 
what do you think this is? What kind of an animal? Any guesses? A dog. Good My daughter said a dog. Yay, <laughs> good guess. There's a dog with flappy ears. Arm, collar on there. Arms. Tennis shoes. Dogs always wear tennis shoes, don't they? Pretty sure. Of course. Mine has them on right now. <laughs> <laughs> Socks. Motion marks. I love to use motion marks. I mean, kids love motion marks to show things, something moving. Maybe a couple little sweat drops back here. So there you have a little dog. A dog running. And this is how I um, design a lot of my characters. First, I spend a little more time on them. I'll, I'll um, try different proportions and let me try this here. Let's do a circle. Yeah, if I had a marker that's a little darker, huh? Anyway. Okay, Tim, when you're doing the blue and we, we just have to use our imagination right now and all right, what you're doing, you know, <laughs> like we can yeah. see the motion. <laughs> all right, just some basic shapes so that I can come back and draw a big circle here. Any guesses as to what kind of an animal this is? My daughter said a piggy. It is. It's not what I imagined when you started drawing circles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens sometimes. They're a singing pig. How's that? And dancing, singing and dancing pig. All right. Um, let me draw. Let's see. What we have? Yeah, we have more time. Would you like to see one more drawing? So sure. Let's do one more. Yeah. I love yeah. that piggy you made. You like the piggy? All right. These are fun. I could do these all night. All right. Let's see. Here's something that's kind of fun. Um, 
maybe you've seen this before. What does that say? Boy. Can you read that? All right. Somebody told me that I, somebody in my family showed this to me when I was little. If you, you add a few more lines. You can actually make a little boy out of the word boy. That was amazing. So there's a little boy. Ta -da, with freckles. All right. Um, at this point in the presentation, I'm wondering if anybody has a question. Maybe it's something I haven't covered or somebody has a, a question about something I've mentioned. That looks good. Okay. Oh, thank so you. I have... <laughs> thank you so yeah. much. It's always good to hear. So I was able to capture the questions that were in the chat and I had some of my own just in case, okay. but I think this will be more than enough. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the things some people may have missed um, when you had addressed them, but I'm going to go through the questions. Does the publisher pay the illustrator or is that cost um, on the author? Well, <clears throat> there, there are two directions you can go to, sub, to publish a book. One is the traditional route and where you sell a store, your written store, your text to a publisher. Um, and then the publisher selects the artist. They pay for the entire process, including they pay the author for the story. The other direction is self-publishing. And I'm just learning more about this. Um, but my understanding is um, in self-publishing, the author a lot of times pays for the illustration themselves. Um, and there, there are other things involved, like the rights that they, they obtain doing that. And, and so on. But um, if you're interested in self-publishing, a lot of times you pop, you purchase the art. And I could be wrong. There are different, there are a lot of different self-publishing companies where, you know, they might have uh, different setups, but um, the author would pay for everything um, and then hope to, you know, try to market and sell their books. Um, some self-publishing companies, I think, are, they're starting to have a marketing and sales component where they can help the author push it into the market and make some sales. But uh, I've always, I've only worked traditionally. And so I sell my artwork to the publisher and I get paid for it. That's it. And the author does the same. You don't pay, I don't pay the author. The author doesn't pay me. It's the publisher kind of organizes the whole thing. And then, you know, markets, sells, and sends uh, royalty checks. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's, if, if it works, that's the way, that's the way it uh, ends up. The ultimate goal. Yes. Yeah, but yes, you are right. I am a self-published author myself. Um, so yes, this author pays for everything themselves. Yep. So including the illustration. Um, how different is it working with celebrities or athletes? Um, Cindy mentioned that you are working with, you have two books published by athletes. Um, so how different is that working with them than traditional authors? Is there a big difference? Um, sometimes the, the, a, pub, uh, um, a celebrity might have a little more input into the project. And I didn't bring the, I was gonna put a footloose in here. 
Uh, but anyway, I've, I've done one book with an athlete, uh, Knuckleball Ned, and that was um, a baseball theme. Um, and then I've done a book with Christy Yamaguchi. Um, I've never spoken to her directly, but I'm sure she had some input into the book. And so did uh, Neil Sadaka, who's a, a singer, wildly successful singer from like the 50s, 60s, maybe even the 70s. I'm not, I can't remember, but um, he did a dinosaur pet. And um, then I did a book with Kenny Loggins. If you're familiar with Kenny, Kenny Loggins had, is um, another really um, successful and talented singer songwriter. And he did a lot of songs for movies during the 1980s. So he wrote Footloose, um, the song Footloose. He rewrote the song as a kid's story. And then we made that into a picture book. And so, um, He's the only one out of that whole group, I, I believe, that I've spoken to directly. Um, he called, he had some ideas for how to tell this, how to get into the story in the beginning of the book. And, and uh, so I was, you know, really glad to, to get his call. I don't mind working with an author, um, but usually the publisher will try to keep the author and illustrator separate. Um, that's all, almost always, except for the celebrity books. Uh, how it works because they don't want too many cooks in the kitchen I mean you can get one uh, opinion from the author and it might be totally different from the opinion of the publisher and so um, but uh, yeah celebrity books they usually um, are more hands-on with their projects Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question that came through do you ever get to contribute to the story or perhaps, um, your drawings inspire a change to the story? Um, you know, the only thing that comes to mind is I had done a, a, a drawing, I don't have it with me, of um, a little boy looking in the side of a hill <clears throat> at a little door in the, in the, the little hill, a knoll. And behind him is a little rabbit in a tuxedo coat kind of a thing. And he's watching the little boy knocking on or looking in the door and I showed that drawing it wasn't a story per se it was just a drawing I showed that to to um um oh now I, his name um you can tell it's getting late Jan Jan Wall who wrote the toy circus I would meet him once in a while up in Sylvania, Ohio, and we'd have coffee. And so I showed him my drawing and he said, you know what, I have, I'm working on a story that's, I, I think that might work in my story. So he rewrote the middle of the rabbit club is the story he had. And so he put my image uh, description into his story. And that then I, became a book and I illustrated it in a totally different technique. But um, that was one piece of art that kind of you know, it worked backwards. It, it influenced the the text of the story. It's the only one I can think of. Sorry, that's I had a brain, awesome. brain fog there. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's super cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you considered moving into digital art using digital tools and applications? Yes. As a matter of fact, all of my new books are digital. Um, the I've always worked in oils or acrylic through the years, but the Backroads Country Toads, which I showed you, this is my first digital book. This was done in Photoshop. So I did that all digitally. And then uh, it's better being a bunny, the cartoon stuff I, I can do uh, digitally. Uh, Buddy's new buddy was digital, all Photoshop. And the reason I didn't jump into and, and then the Memoirs of a Tortoise is also Photoshop. Um, I didn't find tools that I really liked for a number of years. And everything looked, you know, when I first, when artists first started working digitally, it looked digital. It looked computer generated. And I wasn't really, you know, I, I didn't like it so much. But now they, they're able to make tools, painting tools and brushes, digital brushes that, um, simulate painting with oils or you know charcoal or 
a pencil line. Pretty amazing. So I, I thought I'd give it a shot. I've done, you know, a handful of books like that. I'm actually thinking I might switch back to acrylic and oil. I kind of missed, I, I kind of missed the uh, traditional painting um, techniques. So I might jump back. I mean, pros and cons, you know, on digital, you can switch backgrounds easily, switch colors, you know, make alter sizes of things. Um, you know, if it's traditional art, there's a lot of starting over, you know, that sort of thing, if you want to change something. But we'll see. Yeah, so okay. I've done both. Yep. Okay, the last question, uh, what publishers are good to approach with children's books? Well, that, you know, there a lot of publishers produce children's books. Um, what you might want to do is to, to see if the, the content of your story fits a certain type of publisher. Um, and obviously, a, a Christian content might be more accepted by Christian publishers than the mainstream uh, publishers. But you can, you know, you can get names. And there used to be a book called the Art of the Children's Book Market, something like that, Writer's Market. Um, I don't know if that's still being published, but it would list all the publishers, what kinds of work they were looking for, who to contact, how to contact them. And then throughout the book, there would be also stories about preparing your um, story as a manuscript, you know, you know how to uh, submit to a publisher and things like that. The Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which I was a member of for a, a long, long time, they have a lot of information that you can um, get online. Um, and I think even without becoming a member, there's still a lot of information on their website about submitting to a publisher and that sort of thing. And there are local chapters of that organization, uh, several in Ohio even. So it's a good group. All right, Tim, this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and You're the drawings. Those were so cool to see thanks. in real time come to life. That was absolutely amazing. So well, round thank of applause. You. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. And I'm glad to be with you. And I'm, uh, good luck to everybody with your stories and publishing if that's uh, you know your path. So have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. All righty. Good night. see. Should I just press leave and let you go? Have you ended the session? You can do that. You can do that. They're going to go into breakout rooms. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>